Right, okay, folks. Um, <laughs> this is going to be another one of those. These don't happen very often. So the the way I plan my interviews is I can't risk investing time in researching a topic thoroughly, especially when it's uh, uh, the perspective, the particular perspective of a of a particular person, um, just on a whim, hoping that after I've researched it, that I can invite them onto the podcast and that they'll agree to it. So I've tried that. So you're saying you haven't read my uh, three books and 55 articles? (laughs) I've read two of your studies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I've I've read some of the the, the manuscript that you've you've got for your forthcoming (laughs) book. But so... But here's the thing. <laughs> no need to apologize. I'm no, just well, keep. well, here's the thing, Eric. So what I, what I tend to do is I will stumble across topics either by, um, you know, from past guests or I'm, I'm just stumbling around Amazon or whatever. And I'll, I'll stumble across a topic. and Oh, that sounds interesting. And then I'll read a little bit about it. And then if if that still intrigues me, then I'll put the invitation out. Then when the guest says... Okay, let's do it. We'll set a date. That's when I do the research. Now, most of the time, that works out fine. Occasionally, I'll drop myself in it because the the, the problem with that approach is that, well, occasionally I'll find a topic which I f- which seems to be sort of above my intellectual capacity to adequately comprehend it. Let's put it that way. I've done it twice before. I've done it with psychoanalysis with Elizabeth Lumbeck. I did it with perceptual control theory and the transdiagnostic conceptualization of mental illness with Warren Mansell. And I might have done it again. (laughs) (laughs) I might have done it again. We'll see. So we're talking about today's topic is introspection, which sounds like it did to me (laughs) fairly simple on the face of it but we're about to find out. So my guest today is Professor Eric Schwitzgabel. Eric is Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Riverside, whose research explores the connections between empirical psychology and philosophy of mind, especially the nature of belief, the inaccuracy of our judgments about the, sorry, the inaccuracy of our judgments about our stream of conscious experience and the tenuous relationship between philosophical ethics and actual moral behaviour. Eric is the author of Perplexities of Consciousness and co-author with psychologist Russell T. Hurlbut of Describing Inner Experience, Proponent Meet Skeptic. Um, Eric also maintains a weekly philosophy blog at The Splintered Mind. So, Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, I think a good a good place to start before I ask you how you came to specialize in this topic is let's start with a, a definition. Let's start by actually defining introspection. Yeah, let, it's it's again it's it's one of those that <laughs> that's got that's got a simple definition, which might be my definition, and then um, a more thorough definition. So I'll hand that over to you. Yeah, introspection is one of those things that seems so simple and then is so complex when you look at the details. So I think of introspection as a kind of changing suite of processes that are involved. It's not a single thing. Uh, When you're trying to figure out what your own current or recently past experience is or has just been. So it's, you've you've got to have kind of three features that are necessary for a judgment to be an introspective judgment. It's got to be um, about yourself. Presumably you can't introspect what's going on in anyone else's mind. It's got to be about your mind, right? You can't introspect what clothes you're wearing. Although you could introspect what clothes maybe you think you're wearing. Okay. (laughs) that makes sense (laughs) and it has to be current or recently past right you can't currently introspect how you were feeling yesterday although maybe you could currently introspect how you now think you were feeling yesterday so it has to result or be aimed toward resulting in a judgment about your own 
currently ongoing or recently past mental life. But not any such judgment is introspective, right? Because um, I could say be listening to a psychologist who says, well, I think you're angry with your spouse, right? And I could say, well, maybe she's right. <laughs> and I might be thinking that I might agree with her not introspectively, right? That is an example of a non-introspective judgment you might make about your own current mental life. So there has to be some kind of um, internal aspect to it. It has to be not primarily by means of reaching out to the outside environment or hearing something from someone else or seeing something on a brain scanner. Yeah. Okay. So that's so, a, that's the first that's the first start. Yeah. We well, see the the reason I, th I thought this was relevant to you know this this podcast primarily covers mental health and it's it's introspection is the thing that uh, psychotherapy rests upon it's it's that how are you feeling in this moment what do you want to talk about and speaking about your emotions and, and <clears throat> like you're saying it's it's part of it is about talking about um how you may feel in general how you you felt the other day but again quite a lot of it is how are you how are you thinking and feeling now what's going on in your mind or in your heart right now and this idea that your perspective is that we are notoriously bad at actually conveying th what's going on inside has got has got clinical implications to it which which we'll get to right. <laughs> but <laughs> before we get into it now just taking a step back i've got to ask when you decide to become a philosopher there's plenty of, there's plenty of, of subject matter you know something the meaning of life something that feels a little less conceptually complicated so why why this why latch on to this in particular why introspection in particular yeah yeah well i can tell you the history of that and maybe that will help you see a little better kind of where i'm coming from too okay so um you know, there's, so there's one thing that I think is is wrong about introspection is this idea that it's you've got some kind of simple ability to detect what's going on in your own mind at any moment, right? So Descartes, famously, and I think at least at some times he did in fact do this. Uh, there's some historical dispute about this, but um, Descartes at least at certain moments said there's one thing that you can know absolutely for sure, and that's your own ongoing mentality your stream of experience right that here's something you, you can't doubt right you drop a barbell on your toe and your toe hurts a lot right you cannot doubt that you're in pain that's you know so that's something that's absolutely secure descartes thought there's this long tradition in philosophy of thinking that even if you are a brain in a vat being stimulated by neuroscientists, or even if it's all just a dream, here's what we know for sure. I know for sure that I'm experiencing pain, even if I don't know for sure what the outward world, that the outward world even exists. Yeah, so this is um, cogito ergo sum. Uh, I think yes, therefore right. I am. So I, I think remember, therefore the, I am. <laughs> I can't remember what, right. the, the, what was the, the original French translation. Um, I can't remember what that is off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, well, he wrote it in both French and Latin, right? So, yeah, the the he wrote, so, it, uh, he wrote it in Latin because um, it, sorry, in in French because was that it was more accessible, wasn't um, Latin right. sort of the the language of the the intellectuals and the academics? That's right. He wanted to be more accessible than a, than a purely Latin text. But cogito means I think, and some means I am, right? And uh, Descartes thought that I think and I am are two things that are you know absolutely for certain. And when he says, I think, he's also referring to, uh, here's where you get a little more textually nuanced, right? But I think he's also referring to the fact that I have a, an experience of a certain sort or I have a thought of a certain content. Uh, and so that's where the example of knowing that you're in pain would be, would, f would fall into that. So Descartes, in a long philosophical tradition, held through most of the 20th century, that the thing we know really most for sure is our own mind. And the external world, well, probably we know that pretty well, too. But some of them thought the only way you get to know about the external world is by first knowing your own mind. You know that you're having certain visual experiences. You know that for sure. 
right? And then you can infer, oh, there must be something behind those experiences. Now, in cases of illusion, that in inference is mistaken, right? But you start with knowledge of your sensory experience, and from there, you infer what the world must be like. Now, some philosophers thought that, but even the philosophers who didn't think that tended to think through most of the 20th century that we have this really excellent knowledge of our own stream of conscious experience. So I was in a philosophy department in the 90s in Berkeley, um, you know, kind of being immersed in this. And then I went into this developmental psychology laboratory, Alison Gopnik uh, ran at, at Berkeley, and I was very interested in uh, developmental psychology. And, and there were all these experiments going on with Alison Gopnik and uh, John Flavel over at Stanford across the Bay, where these little kids were making just what seemed to be just whopping mistakes about their own minds and other people's minds. And it just fits so poorly with the philosophical tradition that I found it really interesting. So let me tell you about one of John Flavel's, if you don't mind, is this too much of a tangent? No, no, go for it. Okay. So let me tell you about one of John Flavel's wonderful experiments. He's got, he's got this, uh, he and his, a couple of his co-authors have this wonderful piece where they're trying and trying and trying to get four, four and five-year-olds to kind of just get the idea of a stream of experience and the idea that people could have, have thoughts about reality. They're kind of separated from the reality. And the kids are struggling to get this very basic, what we might think is a very basic concept. So here's one of his experiments, just one of many, right? So he, he, he has a uh, library bell, one of those little things you, you, hit the top and it goes ding, right? Yep. So he, he holds it under the table and he says, I'm going to ring the library bell. And he waits five seconds. Ding. And the kid's like, you know, okay, well, what's going on? <laughs> he says, I'm going to ring the library bell again. Waits five seconds. Ding. And then he says, I'm going to ring the library bell, bell again. And he waits 10 seconds. And then he says, are you thinking about anything? And the kids will not say, most of them, majority will not say that they're thinking about the library bell or whether he's going to ring it. They don't, although we think they must be thinking, because they're sitting there, as he describes them, like eagerly waiting for this library bell to get rung and wondering what this, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And yet they're not describing themselves as having thoughts about that or even necessarily about anything. He'll ask, are you thinking about anything? Um, no. He'll have he'll have people he'll he'll he, he another in another version of this he's got there's a, a clear bottle that has a pear in it you could kind of wonder how does the big pear get in through the narrow neck of the bottle All right so he has one of his uh, assistants looking at the bottle kind of wrinkling her brow and he asks if she's thinking about anything well kids don't know and they don't think she's thinking about anything although we, the adults will say well she's thinking about how did the pear get in that bottle. So there are these wonderful experiments that, on the face of it, look like the children don't have a very good understanding of the fact that people, most people, have a stream of experience in their minds that kind of reflects confusing things in the outside world sometimes. Would, that, would it be possible that maybe children don't have that stream of consciousness experience, that maybe it's not something that's developed yet because there's, a certain, there's yeah. a certain level of abstraction involved in 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 stream of consciousness it, yeah. it i was going to say it feels abstract and we're going to probably get into all <laughs> this it, 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 yeah. it, it, it seems like a, an abstract experience and things like um well actually my daughter did this the other day it was the classic thing of the 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 experiment with the the putting the hand in in the bottle to get something and oh yeah. Once they once they close the hand, they can't get the bottle out of the neck. She actually did that. Yeah. It takes a certain level of abstraction to right to to figure that out. And I'm just wondering if if that that's a thing <laughs> that when when you when you say to a child, are you thinking anything? And they th and no, <laughs> maybe maybe maybe, the, maybe they're not. As maybe metacognition hasn't developed at that age. But I don't know. What do you mm. think of that? Well. You use the word metacognition, yes. and I think maybe that's right, right? Or I'm not sure that's right, but it's uh, right. It, what's, what Flavel's experiments seem to suggest is that children don't have much metacognitive knowledge. They're not cognizing very well about their own cognition. Um, but it is a, I mean, uh, but it's a, it's a stranger thing to say. But maybe it's true. 
But it's a stranger thing to say that they are not actually thinking, right? That they're not capable of, say, thinking about whether that library bell is going to be rung, right? So the I think the kind of, we don't know for sure, but the kind of intuitive thing to say is that the children are thinking about whether that library bell is going to be rung or what is this strange guy doing, mm-hmm. but they're not capable metacognitively of reflecting on the fact that they're having those thoughts or right. reporting them accurately. So that's the, I mean, so Herbert thinks maybe is one of the co-authors that uh, you mentioned when you were going through my books. Um, uh, he thinks maybe children aren't thinking at all. Right. And I think that is a possibility, but, um, but more likely it seems to me that they are thinking they're having probably not just thoughts, having some sort of experience of surprise or anticipation or confusion about the library bell that's not ringing yet. And yet they're not capable of reflecting on it and correctly judging that they're having those thoughts. That's kind of the idea. Right. So these, uh, a, di- a good distinction to make between the, the, the various views on this would be, uh, so you call it infall- infallibilism, not quite infallibilism, and then your position on this. And so I would say the, the infallibilistic perspective would be probably the one that most people subscribe to. I think if you, if, if you posited the idea to somebody that they don't actually know what's going on within themselves, that they lack the ability to introspect, the gut reaction for most people would, would be like, well, I know exactly what's going on within me. In fact, th- there's a certain arrogance to you telling me that I don't know what's going on within yes. me. Um, and so, you know, I, and I, you know, if I, I look inside myself now, I can tell you exactly the way I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, the, any sort of visualizations that are going on. And so I would, would that be the, the infallibilist perspective? <laughs> Yes, that's correct, right? So, um, yeah, to bring us back around from our tangent, right? So the, so you might or might not agree about the kids, but the, at least what it triggered in me was the idea that, wow, four-year-olds can be so wrong about what's going on in their own minds, but here are the, all these philosophers saying adults are absolutely perfect, right? They're infallibleist in the sense that you can't possibly be wrong about your own stream of experience. Um and also, I think if you look in the psychological literature, not the philosophical re- literature through a lot of the ni- through a lot of the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, you see a lot of psychologists skeptical about people's accuracy in making judgments about their own stream of experience. So it seems to me like there's this kind of ordinary common sense idea that the philosophers are latching onto that you just can't, if you if you say you're in pain, how could you possibly be wrong about that? If you say, I'm thinking of a banana, how could you be wrong about that? Of course you're thinking of a banana, right? So there's that commonsensical thing that philosophers are latching on to. Infallibists say you can't be wrong. To be infallible, is, it's, it's impossible to be wrong. The, at the same time, you get this uh, psychological tradition, partly in developmental psychology, which influenced me, but partly, say, in, in Freud, uh, also in the early introspective psychologists like Wundt and Titchener, um, and in more recent psychology of cases where it seems like people are wrong about their own mental lives, like almost any aspect of their, of one's own mental life, you can be wrong about. Uh, so there's this tension there. There is this tension between what was kind of dominant in philosophy in the late 20th century and what was dominant in psychology. And so I was a philosopher who was very influenced by the psychology side of that and wanted to help, you know, as I saw it, (laughs) bring philosophers to appreciate a little more how inaccurate we can be about our own experience against infallibilist views or against, as you said, like near infallibilist views on which, well, maybe you can concoct some weird, rare case where you're wrong about your experience, you know, so we're maybe not perfectly infallible, but, you know, almost all the time we're right. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know if this is your exact perspective. So this is from one of your papers. I think this was you saying that this is an idea that should maybe be represented in philosophy and that that's, um, we have no reliable means of learning our own ongoing conscious experience, our current imagery, our inward sensations. We are in, in the, we are as in the dark about that as we are about anything else, perhaps even more in the dark. So. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, that sounds quite sounds quite extreme. And so, yeah. So, I'd like to sort of go through those now, and and so we've given the we've given the the that experiment with the children. I was wondering if there's anything we can maybe do in real time, um, or maybe just something that's a bit easier to comprehend for people to comprehend about demonstrations of how and why we are um, inaccurate about our um, about the ways we describe or conceptualize the, um, our imaginations, um, emotional experience and, and, and visual experiences. If there was maybe one example for, for each of those that you could give. Yes, right. Um, so let's start with visual experience maybe. So just to be clear, but I guess I'm being a philosopher, but just to be clear about what you were saying about the, the position that we're never right or almost we're completely in the dark about that. That's not actually my position. It's, uh, yeah, as you said, it's a position I think should be out there among the skeptical positions. I think that we are sometimes right, but much less right than we tend to think we are and that we know the outside world better than we know our own minds, right? So I know better the property, the existence of this cup and it's kind of medium sized properties that I know the existence of my current emotions and their properties, right? So if you take two kind of comparable sized things, my current emotion, this cup, um, I know the cup better than the emotion. That's my view. So, um, but it's not like I don't know my emotion at all. So, but let's show, well, so shall we do visual experience first? Or emotional experience now I've changed the topic to emotional experience yeah well I mean I, I'm, <laughs> you know emo emotional emotional experience would be more sort of um, apposite for for this podcast right and you see I'm I'm somebody who's aware of the 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 fallibilities of of things like self-reporting in uh, in mental health studies and the like yeah and and you know, I'm I believe that to be the, to be the case. I think actually the, the 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 stats and statistics bear that out as well. But at the same time, I would say I feel quite confident in being able to grasp and conceptualize and describe my own emotional inner experience, having spent you know spent so many years doing so <laughs> and specializing in it. Right. I'd I'd argue that I'm pretty good at it. So I'd be interested. If you could maybe trip me up on that and, and make me yeah. think otherwise. So let me start with vision and then imagery, and then I think that might help create the case for emotion. Okay. And you can kind of see how my thinking works on this. So take visual experience. Um, most people, when I ask them casually, like how much of the world can you see in, at once in a kind of with clarity of detail and specificity of color, they'll tend to say, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 degrees to hold their hands out a certain distance. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm thinking push, that now, yeah. <laughs> if you're measured geometrically, it might be, you know, like 90 degrees or 60 degrees or something like that, right? That's what most people say when you ask them casually. Now, here's a physiological fact, right? The, um, the fovea of your eye, which is the only place that's capable of getting detail shape and color information is a, is about one to two degrees of visual arc. That's about the size of your thumbnail held at arm's length, right? So if you hold out your thumb and look at your thumbnail, that's about how much comes into your fovea that you can actually get with clarity at any moment. Wow. Okay. Now your eyes are foveating about five times per second, right? So they're moving, but so you're getting about thumbnail size, pieces of information about five times per second. And somehow we kind of construct this all into a, a perception of the environment. Now, what I'd like you and your listeners to do is to foveate, that is hold your eyes steady on some one particular point. I'm looking right now at the power button on my monitor. Hold your eyes steady there and then Turn your attention without moving your eyes. Just say a little bit to the right or left of that and notice 
whether it seems clear or not. And most people, when they do that, think, you know, it's not so clear, even just a little bit to the side of that thing. Yes. Yeah. There's a reason you move your eyes while you're reading. So now that's kind of artificial. So another thing you can do is you can let your eyes move around as naturally as you can while you, while you find some specific thing in your environment. Like I'll take my cup again, right? My cup's a, it's got some words written on it here, right? And I'll allow my eyes to move everywhere except for there, right? And I'll, I cannot see how clear it is. Even when I'm pretty close to looking right at it, I cannot see how clear it is. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm doing it with a Diet Coke can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm with you so far. All right, all right, so here's another one. This is Dan Dennett, the famous philosopher, has, has suggested this. You take a playing card, a face card from a deck. You don't know whether it's a jack, queen, or king. You don't know what color it is, what suit it is. And you hold it way out by one ear at arm's length. You hold your eyes fixed in front of you, and you rotate that card toward the center. And you see how close you have to bring it to the center before you can tell, before you can tell what color it is, what suit it is, what value it is. Oh, hang on a minute. I might have to try and actually do this. I think I'm you wanna, if you've got a card, do it like right hang, now. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So it's right, best we are you, really it's doing best this on the face guard. Yeah, hang on a minute. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this might not be. This probably won't be perfect. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't found playing cards. What I oh, have okay. found is, I found. Oh, I found playing cards. Ah, okay. I found Uno cards. Oh, good, good. Buried in with the. Uh, oh, in, okay. <laughs> so, I've, okay, I found playing cards, but they are. Marvel playing cards. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Is this gonna is this gonna work? I don't know if you can see them. I hold. It, I I don't see them right now. Oh, yeah, that should work. Yeah, do it. Do, right. Okay. Do it. Right. So, go on. What we're doing here? So you you take one and hold it at arm's length out by one right. ear off off to the side. So the right. So, so I'm shuffling. Can't. It's way out by the periphery. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna pick one at random. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> right, so starting out here. Yep, and then focus your eyes center and don't move your eyes and slowly rotate the card toward the center of your vision and notice how close you have to bring it before you can tell what its color is, what shape's on it, what suit and value it has. Right, so Keep I've got Keeping your about... eyes steady. Yeah. Um, I thought I'd have had it by now. I'm getting nothing. Come on. Your arm is getting pretty close to the center, I think. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still not getting it. I've, I, I think I think it's black. <laughs> I've got black. <laughs> so, and you're about, what, 10 degrees off center now? Five degrees? Yeah. And you're still not even sure of the color. Oh, right. I think... <laughs> <laughs> Look, so there we, we're coming into i think right there i think i've got a nine of spades yes so that, <laughs> that so that, just to see that's how that's, that's how close to center i had to bring it yeah right even that was a partially a guess wow i would <laughs> i would have thought i was i thought i, I would have thought maybe you know a 40 45 degree angle i'd have had that or something okay yeah. interesting right. so here's what i think visual experience is like that it's hard to see that it's like this until you try some stuff like this for a while. I think what you've got is you have a narrow spot of clarity that bounces rapidly around this kind of hazy background. But you rarely notice because wherever you're thinking to look, you turn your eyes that direction, right? So you're like, mm. oh, is this clear? And then you look there. Yep, that's clear. And then is this clear? And then you look over there and, oh, yeah, that's clear. And then you kind of falsely infer that they're all clear at once. But really what you've got, what visual experience is like, I think, is you kind of have this kind of hazy general sense of things. You've got factual knowledge about your environment, but your actual experience is kind of hazy and there's this point of clarity that bounces around it. 
If that's true, then visual experience is very different from what people think visual experience is when you first ask them, right? They people will say, ah, it's a stable field of clarity, maybe, you know, 60 degrees, 90 degrees wide. But the reality is it's this hazy thing where the clarity is tiny and bounces around fast. Yeah, it's almost like sort of, I guess you'd think of uh, of vision as being sort of like a, a like a torchlight, and that would sort of a big spotlight that sort of that spreads out around you. Yeah. And but it's it's it from doing that. That's more like you having a machine gun and sort of just bullet tiny little bullet holes in things <laughs> and 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 inferring the rest of of what's going on from the the small details that are being presented yeah. to you. So let's so let's do the light analogy. Here let me give you another version of the light analogy. People will think vision is like a floodlight. Yeah. We got everything clear at once. But really what it is is you've got a narrow beamed flashlight, right? And you're shining it here at the thing you're interested in, and then you're interested in this thing over here and you shine your flashlight and your flashlight is shining wherever you're interested. So you think it's all clear because whatever you're interested in, you got your flashlight pointing at. Mm. But everything else is in darkness. Sometimes uh, some people call this the refrigerator light error. So, like, imagine a four-year-old who thinks the refrigerator light is always on, right? Because it's always on. She opens the door. Oh, it's on. It closes the door. What yeah. if it's still on? She opens the door to check. It's still on. So she thinks the refrigerator light's always on, right? So likewise, you might think that everything around you is visually clear because wherever you to check, wherever you think to check for clarity, you look right there and then it's clear at that moment but that doesn't mean it was a clear a second before or that it will be clear in another second so what's what are the, what are the implications of that from the 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 standpoint of, of introspection it's you, you can see that you can see the, the the consequences of it from a well i guess a an inference perspective is that a lot of the a lot of the detail that's going on around yourself you, in your, your present moment experience is probably being inferred from um, from more minor details. I can so you can understand how it would affect your present moment experience of the world. But how does that relate to introspection? Right. So I think this is an example of the kind of thing that we do badly in introspecting. We are pretty good at knowing that there's a coffee cup here and a hat here and a computer, mo computer monitor there. We're pretty good at knowing about the outside world. This, but we don't know very much what, our ex what the experience is that we have as the outside world is coming in. Because we're always looking, we're, what we look at and what we care about is that stuff outside, usually. And we don't bother to think very carefully or reflect very carefully on the experiences that we are having of that stuff. So we're right about the things that are out there, but we're wrong about even pretty big structural features of our visual experience. So the I think that's generally the case for our knowledge of our stream of experience. Visual experience is one kind of experience, but I think when we if we think about our auditory experience, if we think about our visual imagery, if we think about our emotional experiences, what we'll find is what we care about mostly and what we're good at is the world. And what we really stink at is ourselves, our experiences that we have of that world. Okay, so let, well, let's, let's move on to that now with, um, so um, is it imagination and then emotional experience? Right, so let's do another one. So let's do uh, an aversion with imagination, right? So the... Um, the very first psychological study ever conducted, I believe, first questionnaire study ever conducted was an imagery study by Francis Galton, uh, published in 1880, I believe. So he asked people to imagine their breakfast table as they sat down to it in the morning. And then he asked them very question, various questions about it, like, all right, now that you've got this image, since people don't have breakfast anymore so much, I changed the example a little bit for my own purposes. So I say, imagine your house or apartment as viewed from the street. So if we take something like that, 
Sorry, I think my computer fan just turned on. I don't know, is that too noisy for the... It, it was a moment ago, but I think we're okay now. <laughs> it's calmed down a bit. It's calmed down just a little bit. Yeah. All right. So imagine your house as viewed from the street. How much detail does that image have? Is it all kind of pretty detailed at once? I'm assuming you can form an image. Some people say they can't. Or do you kind of have to think to fill in the details one at a time? So I is would it? Say, let me yeah. ask before before you answer that. I'm going to ask you a few more questions because part of the challenge here is that different people find different questions challenging. Okay. So I'm going to ask a few, and then the the what I anticipate is that you'll find some of these questions hard to answer. <laughs> right? right? Do you have to fill in the details kind of one by one as you're thinking about it, or are they all kind of there at once? Is yeah. the image all clear? I mean, all well colored, or is the or is it kind of indeterminate in color in some places? If it is indeterminate, how is that indeterminacy experienced? Is it like gray or something? Is the image flat, like a picture would be flat, or is it somehow three dimensional? Is it how much is it like a visual experience as opposed to say a dream experience? So for me, the one thing I'm noticing as I'm trying to picture the house now is that it's it is it's it is vivid. It's vivid. It's three dimensional. It's it's it. The colors, the details are there. But I'm almost do sort of like what we were talking about. Then it's almost um, I have to concentrate on component parts of it. Mm. It's not complete in any one moment. And even when I try right. to make it complete, like I say, this color there, it's three dimensional. It's very, it feels like a, like a very, a, a good visualization, but it's never complete. It's sort of always moving for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's one kind of thing that people report. People report very different things when you ask them this, this kind of question. And here are the kind of two things that I think about that. Right. So, one that I would just want to notice is that most people find it like not totally easy to answer these questions that you could imagine people getting wrong about it. Like if I, if so here's my hat, I wear hats all the time. Right. So if, if someone say like, is this hat all well colored? Is it stable? Right. Is it moving? <laughs> these are easy questions. I don't have to like work hard to figure out the answers to that. But with my own imagery, the same question most people experience, those same types of questions about its general features and structures and clarity and detail, is kind of hard to answer. Stability. So that's number one thing to observe, right? Just the feeling of confidence, I think, is lower than the feeling of confidence we have when we are looking at ordinary middle-sized objects. And then the other thing that I want to just point out from the history of psychology is that people's answers to these questions, there have been hundreds of studies trying to correlate people's answers to these kinds of questions with behavioral measures that psychologists have thought would correlate with people's skill at imagery, and there is very little correlation, right? So people have tried to correlate how vivid people say their imagery is with people's visual memory, with their ability at tasks like visual folding or visual rotation tasks um, and things like that. And they've this the correlations are pretty spotty and not very reliable. So I think there's a couple reasons to, to have some concerns about whether people's hold on their imagery experience is as solid as their sensory hold on objects in the environment around them. Yeah, I think the immediate thing that sort of springs to mind for me there is that when you're talking about like you're holding up the hat and describing the hat, that's the, the the process that's going on there is that the relationship between the objects and the observer is 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 more simplistic. It's very much sensory input interpreting that sensory input into um, into language and then conveying that. Whereas with introspection the 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 person doing the observing is the it's the same being 
doing yes. the observing as creating the image in the first place. Right. And so that when I'm I'm thinking about the me trying to visualize the the house and it's it's almost like a tennis match of 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 conscious experience. It's like I I posit the 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 idea of the the house in my own mind and then I observe it and then interpret it and then know then to switch back to picturing the house. Right. And the interpreting it is changing it probably, right? In the act of interpreting it, you're you're changing it. You're probably not aware of how much you're changing it. If well, we see, use that would that would be an interesting argument for this idea of infallibility because surely you you could argue that because I'm the person, I'm the the possess the consciousness that's positing the idea and constructing it in the first place. Yeah. That my interpretation of it is surely perfect. Right. I think that does work for some things. So if you say I'm thinking of a banana, right. The fact that you are thinking that you think you're thinking of a banana will make it true that you're thinking of a banana. Right. <laughs> right. But if you say I am visually imagining the Taj Mahal with all of its spires and arches simultaneously clear and stable, right. right the fact that you think you're doing that does not mean it's happening. Right. But the fact that you're thinking about your imagery probably still does have an effect. And sometimes it might your judgments about your imagery might be reinforcing the imagery that you think you're having. But in other cases, the imagery might be dissipating in the very act that you're making the judgment about it. Yeah. So, well, one of the, the obvious implications to that would be so if you, you I think we're talking about um, uh, sort of the amount of variables that are involved. So if you imagine a black dot on a, on a white background, that's fairly easy to do. Mm, yeah. But then when you're sitting down with your psychotherapist and they are asking you about uh, an argument that you had with your partner a couple of weeks ago, the amount of variables involved in that, the setting, the time, the, 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 the content of the argument, especially things like what that person said, how that person behaved, your it's easy to see how your how far removed your interpretation can then become yeah especially if we insert into the so not just recalling the the incident in the first place imagining the incident and then like you were just saying then imagine it so we're imagining it wrong in the first place it's never going to be a perfect representation of what actually took place and then you're interpreting the image that's inaccurate in the first place. Right. Wrong. And right. then possibly even conveying that experience to your therapist in using inadequate language. Right. So that by the time you're discussing this with your therapist and that's all, all the information they've got to, to try and assist you is what you give to them. They're then helping you based on information that's far removed from the truth. Yeah. 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 I think that's right. So, yeah. So, so bringing it from vision, visual experience to visual imagery to emotion, right? So if you, if you think about how wrong you probably are or plausibly were, at least according to me are about your visual experience, and then think about that imagery experience and think about how that was hard and how, despite confidence about your visual experience, you might've still been quite wrong about it. Right. You have the same, you have even less confidence about your visual imagery experience probably. Right. You can still be pretty wrong about that. Now take it to your emotional experience, right? Same basic thing, right? If someone asks me, what is your emotional experience right now? How do I figure that out? This is as hard a task, at least I think, as that imagery experience. So let me just tell you right now, I have a little bit of a feeling in my stomach. And I don't know if that's a little bit of indigestion from lunch or whether it's part of an emotional experience of slight anxiety about being interviewed, right? I'm in a social situation where I think, oh, well, maybe this is a kind of situation that would bring out a little bit of anxiety. So I use that cue to help reach a judgment about what my emotional experience is, right? There are certain things I'm inclined to say, words that are apt to come out of my mouth that might seem kind of socially appropriate or situationally appropriate. Maybe I just kind of allow my mouth to open and then my judgment follows my mouth as it were. But does that mean that's what my experience was at the moment? 
I am much more confident about the properties of this hat than I am about the properties of emotional experience. I'm not even sure about the most basic label, like whether I'm feeling kind of excitement versus anxiety, right? Whereas this hat, like no problem about the basic label hat. Let's get into the details. Right? With the emotion, even before you hit the details, just the, even the very first basic label can often be hard. Now, look, if you're enraged, maybe it's not hard, right? But, of course, there are plenty of people who pound the fist on the table and say, I am not angry, right? <laughs> so, right, so my basic perspective is that um, we don't really know our own stream of experience very well. We, we know the outside world a lot better. When we try to reflect on our experience, we're lucky if we kind of get the basic structural fe features right and the basic category labels right what we care about we don't care usually to turn our eyes on ourselves and think about ourselves we care about the people around us we care about our social successes and failures we care about the physical objects around us that kind of stuff but we don't really find ourselves despite our talk about happiness which we can get into if you want <laughs> but we don't really find ourselves very much caring about like what is my actual emotional experience right now yeah, so I mean, it, it it sounds there like you're kind of saying that it's well, when you're dealing with a pure emotion, like you were saying, you're enraged. So I mean, even even not enraged. So I, if we if we carry on with that, this idea of the client sitting down with a psychotherapist and they've had th this argument with a partner, and the therapist says, "How do you feel about it?" and they say, "I'm super pissed off with them about it." It's just there. It, it's it. That's not enraged, but saying I'm, I'm really pissed off with them. It's a it's a very definite experience. It seems to be quite easy to look inside and feel that. That's I feel pissed off. I mean, I'm pointing here. That's probably there's probably something going on with there without that, doing that. But right, it seems a very very simple emotion to grasp. I'm pissed off with the situation, and and the the language is very simple, but it does it perfect justice. So what's wrong with that? Because that, again, that would seem to me like perfect representation of what's going on internally and, and expressed in perfectly adequate language. There doesn't seem any disconnect there. Right. So I think um, probably more often you're right than you're wrong when you say things like that, right? So I'm not a total 100% skeptic. Um, is it about the, yeah. the, the purity of the emotion? Because uh, on the opposite side of it, where you've got a very, de you know, rage, I don't know why, rage seems to be a very definite, rage <laughs> and anger, and th is, there's, yeah. there's something very definite about that. But then people right. will say that they feel conflicted about a, 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 a situation, or they feel confused right. about it, which there's, there's less confusion, it, there's less intensity to confusion. There's less in intensity to feeling conflicted. Whereas, right. you know, the same with like being in love that, you know, yeah. if you're totally just besotted. It's, it's a very pure emotion. Yeah. And so is, is, is that what the problem is that introspection gets more difficult to do the less pure or the, the more ambiguous the emotional experience is? Well, let's take the pissed off case. Cause I want to pull apart three different things. Right. And I actually think all three things are a little hard, but in different ways. So let's say that you're pissed off at your partner for something she did last week. Right. You say that. Here are three things, right? One is, is the emotion that you're currently feeling being pissed off? Another is, you're pissed off that she blah, blah, blah. Right. Did you get the that she blah, blah, blah part right? And, the, and the, the final part is, what is your experience of pissed offness kind of like experientially like? Right? Because you could say completely calmly with no emotional experience at all, I'm pissed off that she blah, blah, blah. Right? As it, can, it can be a general state of piss offness with your partner right? that she always does this. And she's always like, right now I'm perfectly happy, but I can say. <laughs> right. Right. Just like you say, you know, oh, someday I want to go to Hawaii. Right. It doesn't mean you're constantly full of this impulse to go to Hawaii. Right. So. Right. So there are three things. Right. There's that immediate emotional experience that may or may not be present in the moment. There's whether 
pissed off is the kind of correct category label. And then there's the, the content. I'm pissed off that such and such, right? I think you can probably go pretty wrong about any of those three elements, right? You can be hurt maybe instead of being pissed off. Are you sure that pissed off is the right label? You could think you're pissed off that she was late, but you're really pissed off that she was dishonest and prioritized doing certain things first and was late as a result. And you can certainly be wrong about your, your current, well, certainly. <laughs> On my view, you can be wrong about the, what, it's, what it feels like physiologically for you, whether it's a stomach ache <laughs> due to stress or something else like that, or what are the structural features of the experience as it's ro rolling through you. That's the kind of, that latter kind of stuff is, is the kind of stuff I was thinking about. Um, that's most analogous to the visual experience and the imagery experience, the kind of like felt flow of the emotion, right? So you've got the label, you've got the content that attaches that label, and you've got the felt flow. And even I think once you pull those three things apart, you can kind of see how it's not always so, you're not necessarily right about any of those. Yeah, um, well, so, I mean, the... The, the things that sort of sprang out to me there are wondering whether this is, um, well, so I was thinking that one issue would be this idea of people not being very in touch with their emotions. So whether the ability to connect with your emotions in, in an accurately representative way is a, a, a skill to an extent, just something that some people can do better than others. Um, but that, that being the case still doesn't undermine. In fact, it probably just bolsters the idea that you can be bad at introspection. But another part of it, it I wonder whether it's, is it just a, is, it, is this a linguistic problem? Is it that emotion that we, even, even if we're bad at sort of conveying it, explaining it, locating it, we still feel it. We, st we still feel it as intensely, regardless of how good you are at explaining it. You know, people feel it to the extent that they fall in love and spend the rest of their life with somebody. People feel emotion to the intensity that they end their own life. And so our, our inability to sort of describe what's going on, locate it in sort of space and time or within us, it doesn't negate the fact that it happens. So I just wonder whether right. the, the problem is a communication problem. Yeah. So I wouldn't say just communication, but I think you're right. And this kind of goes back to what we're talking about with the kids, right? So I do not deny that you've got like motions going through you and they might, they, you know, yeah, people commit suicide and do all kinds of things. Right. But the, the hard thing, the thing that maybe four-year-olds are amazingly bad at and that adults are way worse than they think they are at is taking it, looking at it, saying, this is what it is. These are the properties it has. This is the label it deserves. This is how it fits into my life, right? That, that kind of more intellectual act of figuring out what your emotions are and labeling them and seeing them and understanding them as they occur or in the moments after they occur, that's the thing that's hard. I don't think that's just a, it's partly a linguistic thing, but I think it's also as you were saying before, a meta, a meta cognitive thing. It's a thing about how well we can think about our own mental lives. We think so much about the outside world. That's what we think about. We think about other people's mental lives. We think about our social situation. We think about the stuff we care about. We think about our job. We think about our favorite TV show. We don't think, how happy did that make me feel? How sad did that make me feel? What am I feeling right now in response? I mean, maybe if you sit in the therapy room and the therapist puts you on the spot, then you think about it. But we don't, I don't think we cast that eye inside very much. And so we're not very practiced at it. And furthermore, as you were talking about before, the very act of thinking about it starts to mess it up, right? So it's mm -hmm. something that's hard to hold on to. It's not like a thing like a hat that you can kind of like hold and examine in a systematic way, right? So it's something that's difficult to, 
understand and that we very spend very little time practicing understanding. So no wonder we're bad at it. Yeah, I wonder if it's... It, I don't know if I'm going to articulate myself properly here, but it's... I wonder whether it's sort of like that our conscious awareness is just sort of... It's the... It's sort of epiphenomenous to everything else that's going on below it. Like the, the, the part of us that we are, that we think of ourselves, is sort of like the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so much depth going yep. on underneath there that when the self, when we as ourselves try and turn in on ourselves and look at all the processes that are going on underneath, that like I say, that we're sort of, ep we're the epiphenomenon just sitting on top of all these underlying processes. When we try and turn that an introspection in on ourselves, there's just no way of comprehending what's what's going on. It's a bit like a, you know, it's a bit like a dog staring up at the moon. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, you know, the the dog has, it's got a brain, it's got the eyes, it's got the, it's got ears, it's got all the, all the sensory input that you, it can, that, that we've got. Right looking up at the moon but it just it just doesn't get it and it never will get it and i wonder whether it's whether it's whether it's that that's just going on with us is that it's just it's something that's not doable and the, and the other component of it might be that the part of us sort of um, physiologically that's doing this is is the neocortex the the the, the outer part of the brain and all the the those emotions and those inner experiences, are, I believe, are a part of the, you know, the more prim primitive parts of the brain. And whether that's sort of representative of that depth that's going on is that we're just this little sliver of shit on the top of everything else <laughs> that just, that's just got yeah. no way of comprehending itself that way. So there's a psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, is pretty well known. So I don't know if you've heard of him, but. Yeah. He's got this he's he's got this wonderful analogy of the rider on the elephant. So kind of the conscious mind is the rider and, and it's on an elephant. And the elephant basically just does what it wants to do. And the rider's like, uh, here's what I'm doing, here's what's going on, right? <laughs> oh, elephant, go over that way. And then the elephant goes some different way. And it's like, I really wanted to go that way the whole time, right? So <laughs> Exactly. Your conscious mind yeah. is this hopeless little rider on top of this giant elephant, right? And the conscious mind, it, it has some clue what's going on. But it's not the thing that's mainly in charge, and the elephant's going to go the direction it's going to go, kind of mm, to a first approximation, regardless of what the rider is saying. Now, maybe the rider can do a few things, but um, but yeah, to think that you know this the the our self conception of ourselves kind of accurately reflects the whole the center of our psychology. Um, yeah, that's that's the that's the writer being a little self involved, maybe. The other thing I was thinking of, and this is you know this is another question where I'm sort of punching above my intellectual weight here, trying to conceptualize it, but is that whether so this distinction between Newtonian and Darwinian truth, so that truths that the Newtonian truth would be accurately interpreting the the, the, the material world as it is. And then Darwinian truth would be a truth that serves the survival of the species, even if it's not true out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And so part, part, I'm wondering whether, even though these, the way that when we introspect, the way that images are represented to us, even though they are sort of, we might describe them as inadequate, because the the black and white, or the uh, incomplete, or the fuzzy, I'm wondering whether that undermines their ability to convey truth to us. That just because they're not perfect representations of things out there in the world, that they they sort of the evolution, or evolution always works to 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 serve us as best as it can for for survival. And I'm wondering whether the way that the images are presented to us when we do introspect is is perfect from a Darwinian perspective. That the way the way things like symbolic representation and the like 
that they serve us from that perspective. So even though they're not accurate in a Newtonian sense, mm. they're truthful in a Darwinian sense. I don't know if I've conveyed that question. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so here are two things I think that are in that direction that I would agree with. So one is what gives you success in the physical and social world is probably not accurate introspection, right? So uh, if what you're interested in is, you know, finding a mate and making a salary, right? It's not necessarily, your first priority is probably going to be elsewhere than really detailed understanding of your own stream of experience. That's probably just my guess, sociologically true, right? So from that perspective, what might work better in terms of getting by in the world is confident declarations about, here's what I think, here's what I feel. And no one's going to put the brainoscope up against you and say, oh, no, actually, that's an incorrect description of how you feel and what you're thinking right now, right? You kind of get to be your own authority, even if there's no kind of underlying truth to it, right? The fact that you can kind of say something and take authority for it gives you a kind of, that's a social skill and it has a kind of power and effectiveness in it. And I think we probably do care more and maybe even should care more. No, I don't think should, <laughs> but we do care more. Uh, I think about this, our success in self presenting than in ourself and our success in self understanding. Right. Right. So if you self present in a way that's effective, that's based on an illusion about what you're really like and what your motives are, then, you know, you do well. So is that the Darwinian truth there? Yeah, I guess I guess it would be. I was trying I was trying to come up with an example of how the an inaccurate representation when 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 you introspect an inaccurate representation of of the the way you feel from a Newtonian perspective an in, inaccurate representation of, of a thing that happened would serve you from a Darwinian perspective and therefore become truthful from from the Darwinian perspective, but like like I do sometimes working on the fly, I've got the question. <laughs> but I, couldn't, I, I couldn't couldn't quite come up with an example to to back it up. Um, I get one bringing things to a close now. Quite a big question. This, I guess, is and I suppose the perfect analogy is that the the rider on the back of the elephant, um, where you know. Uh, science is showing this more and more is that you're not really you're not really in control i mean i'm, I'm yet to get to to free will as a concept which i i'm more and more coming around to the idea that it's it, free will doesn't even exist but just you know a lot of the, the psychological experiments just show that this idea of this of 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 people being completely in control of everything and masters of their own destiny it just it just doesn't appear to be the case. And so I'm wondering if adding this idea of you, you can't even it, coming back to, um, Descartes, um, the, you know, the one thing we know is our, is ourself and that, that we exist, but even that's a bit, a bit shaky from, from this, from what we've been talking about and introspection. You can't even necessarily, one can't even necessarily know thyself. So as a result of that, is there even a self or is the, is self just an illusion? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what a self is. If I knew what a self was, then I could maybe figure out whether there is one. <laughs> well, that's like, again, yeah, but when you say what 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 is the what is the self? I, Here, one one way of thinking about the self is that it's a kind of um we are willing to take responsibility for doing things and we're willing to plan for the future. So we kind of looking back, we say, Oh, that was us looking forward. I say, I say, that was me looking forward. I say, I'm going to do that in the future. Other people do the same. And so we kind of, there's something about our, the way that we think about ourselves and our social interactions with other people that make it the case that 
there's this entity, Eric Schwitzgable in my case, <laughs> that we can kind of talk about and think about the past and the future of, right? In that sense, there's a self, but it's a self partly because we construct it that way as selves, as individuals, and as um, people interacting with the, with the selves or individuals around them. Now, that's a very different kind of and a more kind of limited type of self than some really, you know, like metaphysical hard nut, mm. you know. But in that, if, if we downgrade our idea of what a self is to something closer to that, you know, with maybe memory continuity and things like that also, then then we've got a self in that sense, at least. Maybe that's enough. Yeah, I don't. I think we pop, popped our head down a, a very deep rabbit hole there. <laughs> 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 Is this this is a good question to to finish on before we before we jump into the quick fire questions? Would be is is it possible to get better to to get better at introspection purposefully, like consciously, purposefully make an effort to get better at introspection? If if it is, what's to be gained from that, and then how do we do it? So three part question. Right. So it might be possible to get better. Um, I think the empirical case is still out. There are two major movements, and I'm not including, um, and a third might be kind of um, depth psychology stuff, but uh, there's introspective psychology as it developed in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and then there's uh, meditative practice. And in both of these cases, there have been claims by practitioners that you can train yourself, say, to become an expert, expert introspector or to become an expert mindfulness meditator, right? So that you can notice what's going on, say, emotionally or in your sensory experience uh, in a way that's better. Uh, and there's some plausibility to both of those claims, but the empirical follow through on that has been mixed. So I think it's it might be possible, but we don't really know for sure and no, noticing noticing isn't the same as knowing or understanding though is it no <laughs> right so even both of these both the um both the meditative tradition the mindfulness meditative tradition and the introspective psychological tradition are they're both the primary initial emphasis is just on noticing and understanding those mental states as they're occurring, right? And then there's a further question about understanding their causes, being able to control them. You know, that would then be probably down the road from that. So I don't think we know whether we can get better. I mean, I think people, a lot of people intuitively think that they're better. They, they have got better and maybe that's right. But um, I would be cautious about that. You know, there's a lot of People often think they're good at things that they're not good at. You know, there are a lot of people who think they can pick stocks, but very few people can, be, <laughs> can reliably beat the market, even professionals, right? So, you know, you might have the emotional equivalent of stock pickers, uh, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> Quite like that, yeah. <laughs> um, but is that... Yeah, go ahead. If it was possible, what's to, uh, even if it's just something that humans are going to evolve into... Um, What's to be what What's to be gained from it? So here's one thing that I just find very interesting, and I alluded to it a little earlier in our discussion. A lot of people say that one of the most important things to them is happiness, hmm. but very few people study their own happiness. People don't know whether, like, <laughs> it just struck me one day, like. I thought I hated weeding and I liked going to restaurants. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, I'm actually kind of happier when I'm weeding than when I'm at a restaurant. And it took me a long time to realize that about myself. I'm still not sure I'm right about it, but let's just say I'm right about it. Right. Do you do how many people really know what, when they're happy and when they're not happy and what kinds of things make them happy, right? We hardly pay any attention to them. We say, we give all this lip service to happiness is really important, but we don't follow through. We don't study ourselves. We don't learn what actually causes it or prevents it. So I think 
one of, I think, a really kind of like low hanging fruit, if we could get better self knowledge about our emotions, would be figuring out like, really, does the salary increase make you happy? Or like blowing it off and taking a walk in the sun make you happy? Or, you know, do you really want to go to a restaurant? Yeah, you see, that's something that I think there's a book. I don't know who the author is. I don't know what it's about, but it's called Stumb- <laughs> Stum- and it's called Stumbling on Happiness. Ah, yes, yes. And I think, I think that's, I think that's something that we we can do anyway. One, so uh, just very quickly, I. Back in my youth, I, w- I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was when be- becoming entrepreneurial was the entrepreneurs were the new rock stars. It was you know Steve Jobs and, and all that. And I, oh. I in, in my early twenties, I wanted to to do that and be that. And you know I wanted to have a mansion and fast cars and you know be spending my weekends snorting cocaine off strippers' tits on a yacht, yacht and all that. And when I, I started a business, went bust, and that goal sort of got further away from me. But then. When I was in my thirties, Eric, and I was in the in the garden building a fence, I'm digging fence holes, digging digging post holes for a fence, and it's raining, and I'm cold, and I'm covered in shit, and I'm tired. But I remember thinking, "Oh, this, this is it." <laughs> Honestly, this yeah, this yeah. yeah, this was it for me. This was. This is what I wanted. It was everything sort of fell into place that I, I like the idea of. Um, I've got a bit of a. I call myself an aspiring American. My dream is to one day move to America, somewhere in the South, and get a farm and maybe build. You know, build your own home and and fence fence off your land and and be the king of your castle. And that tiny little insight into it, um, it it was it was it clicked. You know, like a light bulb moment, and. But I, you, there's no way of there's no way of manufacturing that, and it was almost like complete coincidence. But it, that was, I don't know whether that's classed as a very sort of introspective moment where you're very much in touch with what's going on because it was it was it was so primal. Do you know what I mean? It was like yeah. man outside covered in dirt, building a fence, and <laughs> and it was like, oh god, this is it. It's not a, a, a money. And 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 yachts and bollocks to all that. This is it. I want to be out in a, in in the fields digging holes and building things. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I wonder whether that's um, whether that's it's possible to ever manufacture that to just sit down in a chair and introspect to the point where you 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 think you know oh you sit there for an hour and then go oh shit building a fence. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I uh, I think you probably would have to have life experience and then notice what kinds of things, as I think we don't very often, what kinds of things really actually do make us feel good, and what don't, and reliably so. Right. So there would be one. Th- it would be one thing to have that post hole digging moment and have a lot of happiness and think, ah, this is it. And then the next day you do it, do you have the same experience or a similar enough experience? Or, or was it really something other, was it the novelty of digging? And if you were digging for months, it was suddenly not, or, or not so suddenly, <laughs> it would be not so good. What's the actual, what was actually giving you that pleasure at that moment? Uh, was it the primalness? Was it the difference from everything else? Was it some other it, mysterious thing yeah i don't know i just i remember it was it was it was rewarding to be building something something very material that was out there in the world you ch- i was changing the landscape which i know i know this all sounds pathetic i'm building a fucking fence in my garden but <laughs> to me yeah. it, like i say it's very primal and it was like oh my god like i was i'd completely i was i was out of my head i was just working i was i was enjoying it and i felt rewarded and it was like oh god i don't need to be doing all that bullshit to, to, to feel rewarded. I can do something right. a bit more simple than that. And I guess, you know, even even then though, the consequence to that realization is now that the goal has now shifted to something else that I'm now constantly sort of pursuing and getting frustrated right. when I feel not close to it anymore. And right. Yeah. Oh God. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
Right. I'm not I'm so good at this either, right? I'm not so good at this this either. But I do feel like if we spent more time just noticing in some accurate way, if it, to the extent it's possibly accurate, what really does satisfy us in those ways and what doesn't, then we could t- turn our life more in the direction that we say we want to turn it when we say we want happiness. Yeah, well, th- just just one final thought. I mean, I know I'm sensitive with, 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 with time here and stuff, but I was, I was just thinking then that, you know, quite often with, especially with when you come to like mental health, depression, anxiety, introspection's the problem. You know, it's it's turning inward, turning your attention inward and thinking about how you're feeling that can often be the problem. And sort of, you know, that, that what, what I was just talking about is the, the opposite of that. It was being, it's being out in the world and not introspecting that, that was very sort of, instantaneously curative. Again, I don't think it's something you can manufacture. I'm not recommending everyone go out and start digging fence holes tomorrow um, and that's going to fix you. But I don't know, Eric, after all this, maybe yeah. introspecting's the problem. <laughs> maybe maybe, right. maybe we should not introspect. <laughs> maybe, you should, maybe you should quit and move on to something else instead of encouraging people to do this. Right. Yes, definitely. Uh, sometimes spending a lot of time in these uh, introspective loops might be part of the problem with uh, for certain for certain people. So you kind of you kind of want the insight that maybe comes with noticing what makes you happy and what doesn't. But if you're spending all of your time thinking about the fact that you're so unhappy and kind of coming up with reasons and excuses for why it's the case and then that's probably not a good thing either. Right. Well, even though I've just recommended that introspecting is um, <laughs> potentially a bad thing, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do it <laughs> for another <laughs> another, another few minutes. Um, yeah. But before we jump into that, Eric, if you would just like to take a moment to um, recommend any links you've got, books, anything you'd like to tell the, the viewers, the listeners about, um, feel free to plug away. Sure. So uh, I have a book forthcoming um, from MIT Press called A Theory of Jerks and Other Philosophical Misadventures. Yes. So, so uh, <laughs> let me just jump in and say, so this this is what I stumbled across. Uh, this is how I stumbled across you and your work and um, the, the one of the manuscripts online. And you, I think a lot of it is articles from your blog. That's and right. for anyone that's like, maybe this is this introspection is a bit deep. You talk about a lot of different things, and a very you're a very engaging writer, um, very accessible, and also a lot of your articles are nice and nice and short, like big ideas, but v- quickly and easily digestible. So um, when that book's available, I would highly recommend it. So when's that going to be out, and um, where can people get it? So it should be out. So yeah, I don't know when you're going to broadcast this, but it should be out. This summer or fall, so maybe it's a little. Maybe I'm advertising a little bit too early, but um, and then there's also my my blog, The Splintered Mind. Uh, so I, as you mentioned at the beginning, I post there uh, weekly, typically. Um, so those would be good things to look at. I, I guess uh, I have also two books on introspection. They're a little bit older, but um, I've got one. This is a dialogue with a psychologist where we give a person a beeper. The beep goes off at random moments during the day. And then we interview her at length about what was her experience that last moment right before the beep. So we had, so I and this and the psychologist are interviewing a a woman in detail about 17 seconds of randomly sampled experience. We have a whole book on this. So you get this kind of weirdly, strangely detailed look into just random samples of a person's stream of experience. So some of your readers might find that interesting. So, so those are a couple of suggestions. Yeah, that's the proponent versus skeptic book. So you'll get yes, two different. Yes, it's called describing inner experience. Proponent meets skeptic. So he's a proponent. I'm the skeptic. So we we're arguing about arguing about how well she knows what's going on in her mind. Right. Okay. Well, as always, everyone knows I will include links to all those in the show notes, and then yeah. when it comes time that the the book's released as well, I'll update the show notes to include a, a link to the book as well. So, okay, let's jump into these quickfire questions. So, as always, folks, you get the first one for free, but then after that, you're going to have to help me 
pay these ever increasing hosting bills uh, by signing up on Patreon. It starts at two dollars a month. These AMAs um, and these quickfire questions, a few blog posts, and I'm producing extra content all the time. So just go to patreon.com forward slash M O W E, but my own worst enemy, patreon.com uh, forward slash M O W E. Um, okay, Eric, let's start with the the last book you read and then the best book you've ever read. The last book I read was a uh, history of early China. Um, okay. I've forgotten now, forgotten now what the author was, but I'm not interested in classical Chinese philosophy. Uh, so I've read a lot of the philosophy I was trying to, I've been trying to bone up a little bit more on the history. Okay. And the best book you've ever read? I'd say my favorite book ever is uh, Borges' Labyrinths. You okay. know Jorge, Jorge I've never, never read that, no. Oh, wow. He's this amazing Argentinian writer. Um very surreal philosophical short fiction. Right. Okay. What's that called? Uh, the collection is called Labyrinths. Yep. And it's uh, it's got some really amazing mind blowing stories in there. Right. Okay. Well, like I like to say I'll I'll, I'll look through <laughs> the links in the, in the show notes. It'd be one. It could be one of those. Like I said at the beginning, Eric. I'll I'll go away, check it out. It'll be brilliant, and then I'll have to go find myself a. Um, is he still alive or? No, no, no. Oh well, maybe one of his of these days or something. Are, yeah, yeah, this is more. A lot of the stories are from the forties. Okay, what negative experience has had the most positive effects on your life? Um, my wife and I had a lot of trouble getting pregnant with our second child. We were never able to do that, and so we ended up adopting uh, our daughter, yeah. Kate. And uh, she is so amazing uh, that I can't imagine a biological child having been a better outcome than her. Yeah, we, we're thinking about doing that ourselves. So we, me, me and the missus are getting a bit long in the tooth. Well, <laughs> for, 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 from, from a uh, reproductive perspective, you know, I'm, I'm 37 next. She's just turned 30. And, yeah. um, so we, we want four, but we think we're only going to be able to manage three naturally and then maybe the fourth one we're thinking of adopting so okay i'll tell you there's something that's just totally shocking and amazing to me about adopting i had you know had some concern about us of course well our first child was biological so you know the baby's born and of course you have you had your first already we've had, we've had two you've had two so yeah. the baby's born and most people not everybody but most people is like you're instantly attached right there's no like need to, to like worry yeah, no, it's, oh, it's, do it's I like insane. this kid or not I don't know yeah. <laughs> it's like wow <laughs> <laughs> like instant boom yes and the amazing thing is I thought that might not happen with adoption but for whatever reason however it gets set up all the expectations get built up around it we got our daughter and it was as instant and as natural and as irreversible as when our biological child was born yeah, so that's the, um, so I think everybody knows this. I've mentioned it before. So I was adopted at birth, and my mum said exactly the same thing. So that they were they were both in their late thirties, um, trying to adopt, and they'd been told like it's probably not going to happen now. You you know you're getting a bit old for it, and then um, cheeky bastards. I don't know why they thought I was um, decent fodder to be handing off to this old couple, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Yes, that's the, they said, that, you know, they rang my mum up and said, we've, you know, we've got a little boy here. And she said, as soon as she saw me, it was like, it, that's it. That's my son. So, um, that's yeah. That's kind of amazing to think about. How does that happen? It's not like if a baby goes by in a carriage on the street, I'm not like, ah, oh, that's my <laughs> son. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe there's some people like that, but hopefully not many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what, something, about, uh, something about how that's set up. Something about the expectations around it, you're just ready, and then it just happens. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, no, I, yeah I, look, I look forward to it, doing it myself. Um, okay. What mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better? <laughs> 